Great job, guys. Appreciate that. Abandon. Self-sacrifice. Giving it all. Not worrying about what others would think of or what others would say. Serving Jesus with a pure heart, with an abandonment that everything in life is about the focus that you have on Christ. Well, our mission celebration this entire month is talking about abandon. Talking about, can we serve God with a full abandon, a full heart, knowing that it makes no difference about life or what people think. My job is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world around me. Each one of these flags represents a country that need a relationship with Jesus Christ. People, individuals that have needs. And that need, not necessarily as a financial need, that need is a salvation in Jesus Christ that we have, that God has called us as a church, a mandate, a great commission to go into all the world. That's this month. Each week this month, we're going to be talking about a different perspective of abandonment. We're going to talk about living, loving, serving, and giving, doing what God wants us to do to reach a world for Jesus Christ. Today is a special day because I've asked one of my dear pastor buddies, Tim Adrian, to come and share with us today. Tim, uh, has pa he's pastored his church in Hutchinson for about 16, 17 years. It was very unique that Tim uh, came in and filled in the pulpit at Glenville about 15 and a half years ago. You were without a pastor. And he came in, and he preached, and, and he called me on the phone, and he said, Bruce, I've got a church for you. I said, oh no, what's going on here? And he told me about Glenville, and he even turned my name in to the church to be the pastor of this church. So if you like me, praise Jesus for Tim. But if you don't, blame Tim, okay? That's all there is to it. It's all his fault, good or bad. I appreciate Tim being here. Tim, come on and share your heart with us today about being an abandoned. Thank you, Bruce. God bless, God bless you. It is great to be at Glenville today. I was saved in this church as a little kid. And uh, this, this church, I have a tender place in my heart for this church. And I was baptized in this church as a little kid, over in the, in the little auditorium that you used to use. And I tell you what, my heart was touched as I saw one after another of these boys and girls get baptized this, uh, this morning. I thought, thank God this church is still reaching kids and baptizing kids uh, just like they did me back in the day, back in the long day ago, uh, I might add. And uh, that's, that's a blessed thing. Thank you, Bruce Thomas, for letting me come and be a part of this service today. Uh, I, I was taught missions in this church when I was a little kid as well. And I don't know if I know a whole lot about missions, but I know this. Our God is a missionary God. And this Bible is a missionary Bible. And it's filled with missionary stories. And the church is to be a missionary church. And so today as I talk to you, I want to just give you a little insight in, uh, in what happened to me a few weeks ago and how God did a work in my heart and a work in my life about missions once again. Uh, I want to give you a little report of a trip that I took in July and August of this year. I was for three weeks or so in China, and I'd heard about China my whole life. And there I was uh, invited to this communist country, an atheist country. Uh, in 1949, when Mao Zedong took over China, it was one of the, the tenets of their, uh, of their doctrine that uh, communism will work if we eliminate all religion and we eliminate God. And so for the last 64 years, those people have been been told that there is no such thing as God and there's no such thing as putting your faith and trust in the Lord and there's no such thing as heaven and there's no such thing as hell and there's no such uh, thing as the truth of the Bible. And so I went over there to China and uh, I had some pictures that I want to show you and I know on the back of the bulletin maybe are some notes that you might want to follow along with me as, as well. But Mao Zedong did his best to eliminate God from that culture. Yet today I saw a people that are serving God with abandonment. Uh, in fact, we talk about abandonment. They live abandonment. And I want to just share that with you a little bit today, uh, this morning. First of all, I want to show you the first picture. And... Uh, Neil, if you will, throw that, that up there. We landed in Beijing and uh, went to the, uh, to the terminal that they had built for the 2008 Olympics. This was the largest building I've ever been in my life. And I've been in dome stadiums before, but this, this building was maybe twice the size. It was a modern airport, 
And uh, just an amazing thing as I walked through there. There, I, our, our teaching team came together. We were there not to evangelize, but to teach pastors and assistant pastors and house church leaders. And I'll explain that a little bit more uh, later on. But our teaching team met there at the airport, and, uh, and, and the country host met us there, and we had about a two-hour orientation. And then afterwards, we decided... Okay, we're, we're Christian men, we're all, we were all pastors and missionaries, and we said, let's have a word of prayer about this, and the country host says, now wait a minute, that's don't be praying publicly here, okay, we can't do that. He says, that's pray, that's don't bow our heads. Um, I don't want you to close your eyes, that's just sit here and, and find a corner, find a spot near, in the airport, and just focus on that, and we'll talk to God but we're not going to bow our, our heads. And it dawned on me, yes, things are different in China than they are in the United States. Um, in China, we would, have, we would have created a scene if we would have prayed there in the airport, and we didn't, any, didn't want anybody following us around or anything like that, and, uh, uh, and, and, and then raising a problem for our Chinese brothers and sisters in, in Christ. And uh, so uh, let me show you a picture of the team, and then we'll get to the notes here in a second. This, was, this is uh, really our, our, our teaching team, and um, I want to uh, make mention of the fellow on the, on the front row on the right. His name is Jordan Nisley, and this church supports Jordan. And thank you for doing so. He's a missionary in the Philippines, and he flew up from Manila to be with us on this journey and to help us teach. And, and the guy on my, uh, uh, to the left next to me is a pastor from Pueblo, Colorado, and uh, the, uh, the guy on the right in the back row uh, travels over to China several times every year and does, does ministry kind of on a secret uh, a secret way. Uh, of course, the Chinese brothers that are there, the uh, two in the middle, are pastors. And they both pastor churches. In fact, the guy uh, that is the second from the left just started a church about a year ago, and he's so excited. He has about 150 people in his congregation, and uh, that's, that kind of work's taking place. Now, the guy on the left is um, his dad started a house church years ago. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, a revival swept through China. And in the last few years, it's just exploded. And he told me, he says, I'm, I'm in charge. And, and I was introduced to him this way. He says, I'm in charge of a network of house churches. He says, in the cities and in the villages, uh, there'll be a, a church where people come to a house. And, and there'll only be about 40 or so that will cram into this house. And, and they'll have church. They'll, they'll have a service. And then the people will leave. Uh, usually it's the pastor's house, and then a new group of people will come in, and they might do this several times through the day uh, on Sunday. Can you imagine this, having groups of 30 and 40 people into your house and do that four and five and six times every week? And, um, but that's, that's how they have church, because they can't have too large a gatherings because it would, it would create an issue, and create a problem with the government. And uh, so I asked this guy, he says, well, tell me about your network of churches. He says, well, there's just so many, we can't even keep track of them anymore. He says, but we estimate, well, there's an estimate that we have five million people in our network of house churches. And I said, yeah, isn't that something? And I said, wait a minute, five million? He goes, yeah. He says, that's just in our network. He says, we're the third largest network in China. There are two others that are larger than that. Isn't that something? And uh, just excited about this. Let me tell you a quick little deal. And, and of course, the world's attention was drawn to Beijing in 08 because of the Olympics. But then in 09, you might remember, there was a terrible earthquake in southern China. And it, it killed a lot of people and destroyed some cities. And it was just a, 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 a bad deal. And people basically from the United States just started pouring money into China. And uh, Franklin Graham's organization sent money, World Vision sent money, and, and these groups just began to send money into China. And uh, not a lot of evangelism took place because of that. It was humanitarian aid. But here's the thing. After that, the Chinese government said uh, publicly and officially, you know, these Christian people aren't all that bad after all. And, and because of that, yeah, we can thank God for that. And because of that, the doors have opened up in China. And so here I am as an American guy. I'm, I'm coming into this country. Now I have to, you know, there's a little bit of tension here. Um, the government is like, we know what you're doing. Just don't do it very loudly. And we'll let you do what you're doing. And that's the way the churches are. And they're just going like crazy right now and just mushrooming. This guy told me, he said, we don't need Americans' money. What we need is American teachers 
because we, we don't have any kind of systematic Bible teaching in our country, and we haven't for 60 years. He says, he's told me, he says, our preachers don't know the Bible. Uh, they, they, they can read it. They can't really figure, you know, some things out. And there's no doctrine and theology. Uh, there's, there's no really good understanding. He says, that's where we need your help. And that's, that's, of course, why I went. I want you to just jot this down with me in the notes. Um, let's notice this. Here's the first lesson I learned when I went to China, that the church will survive. The church will go on. You know, uh, Mao Zedong said, I'll squash the church. I'll, I'll make Christian belief illegal. We won't have any religion. We won't have any atheism. But listen to this. They believe there are 80 million believers in China today. Now, they have a, it's a huge country, one and a half billion people, so we're only talking about 6% or so, but Christianity is getting a toehold in China, and uh, the church will survive. Notice this passage of Scripture. Um, it might be on the screen for us. Uh, if not, just, just listen. Uh, and I say unto thee, Christ is speaking, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Christ referring to himself. He says, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what other people have said, we're going to squash the church. The Lord says, no, nobody's going to squash the church. The gates of hell or the forces of evil will not stop the church. Uh, I've been acquainted with Glenville my entire life, literally. When I was born, my parents lived here on this property in a little trailer and brought me from the hospital, from, from St. Joe Hospital here to this property. I've known about this church and there's been some times that the forces of evil have tried to rip this church apart. There's some times that the devil would love to just stifle the work of this church. But thank God for some people who have been faithful to this ministry and sometimes have had to abandon their own desires and their own resources, their own money, their own time and own energy. And this church has survived. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? And so the church will survive. The church in China will survive. The church around the world will survive because it's built on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we went to our first place, our teaching uh, area, and we left, uh, in fact, I, I left from Beijing, got on another airplane, went to some pl a place called Zhengzhou uh, in the middle of China, and while we were there, uh, the next morning, uh, we walked to a hotel that was close by. Then we got in a, in a darkened glass van and uh, the next morning and drove for several hours. We got into this little village, and we had a, uh, our luggage in another car. I didn't think a whole lot about it, except it, it dawned on me on this journey. It was kind of the lookout car, okay? And, um, and so the, that car went ahead of us and would make turns, and, and uh, we got into this village, and we waited for a signal, and we turned into a, a, like a, an industrial plant is what it looked like. Big steel gate. You couldn't see through it. It opened. We drove through, and then the steel gate closed behind us. And there was a courtyard where these, with these big propane tanks, and we drove around the tanks to another gate. It opened, and we drove into a compound that was about as big as this room. And in one corner was a teaching, uh, and I'll show you pictures in a second, uh, a teaching classroom, and then a couple, some dormitories, a uh, sorry excuse for a bathroom in one corner, and um, a kitchen, and it was just this, this little compound. And there was about 50 or 60 people waiting on us, and we began four or five days of teaching. They were all uh, pastors. They were... Um, uh, co they call them co-workers, which were house church leaders. We would call them perhaps assistant pastors or, uh, or so. They put me in a room uh, at night, and I was right next to the meeting room. And every morning I would wake up about 6 o'clock, and I would hear these 60 Chinese people singing to the, I mean, as loud as you possibly can imagine. And then they would pray, and then they'd sing some more, and then they'd pray, and they'd praise the Lord. And they really believed in fervent prayer. I think we have a couple of pictures. Let's show uh, uh, a picture or two. And, uh, uh, and these people would, would shout, literally would shout unto the Lord. Let's go to the next one as well. And I just kind of, you know, snuck in there and took a picture of them. They would do this for two hours every morning. Two hours they would pray. And then they'd listen to me teach for eight hours and then we would close the day with, a, uh, with a, like a chapel service that went another hour and a half or so. And uh, these people were, were quite dedicated. Um, but here's the thing I want to just bring out, and I want you to jot this in your notes. The greatest missionary tool. The greatest missionary tool. It's not money. It's, it's, it's prayer. 
That's the greatest missionary tool. And if it weren't for prayer, the work in, in um, China literally could not go forth. And uh, I was just so blessed when I saw the Chinese people pray and call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to notice this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Notice the Apostle Paul, he says, and finally, dear brothers and sisters, I ask you to pray for us. Pray first that the Lord's message will be spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes. Now, like I said, our God is a missionary God. This Bible is a missionary Bible. And the Apostle Paul says, I want you to pray that the gospel is spread rapidly and that it will be effective wherever it goes. Uh, and then he said, just as it came to you. It's, isn't it good to be reminded how we came to the Lord? The young man that was leading us in the worship said, man, I remember the first time I came to this church. Uh, I remember the first time I heard the gospel. I remember the time that I accepted Christ. And, and it's so special to us, we, but it ought to motivate us then to, uh, to help spread the gospel. Look back at the passage. He says this, pray to that will be saved by wicked and evil people. Apostle Paul, he noted. He said, there's people that are against us. There's people that are against the gospel. Well, I saw that firsthand in China. Um, every one of the people I, I taught and preached to had served time in jail at one time or another just because of their faith. And Paul said, pray that we'll be saved from wicked and evil people for everyone, for not everyone believes in the Lord. But the Lord is faithful to us. And aren't we grateful and thankful for that? So the great missionary tool, the greatest missionary tool is, um, is, is prayer. Um, when I uh, was in China, when I was in Beijing for a few days, I saw a modern city that would have been much like, uh, probably like New York City. Uh, skyscrapers everywhere, uh, just a ton of people. I imagine there's 10, 12 million people live in Beijing at least. In fact, I read on, my, on the trip over, I read, in the United States, we have one city that has 5 million people or more in the city limits proper, and that's New York City. Chicago and LA don't have quite, they're around 4 million in the city itself. Um, of course, the metro area would be bigger. But in China, they have 93 cities that have 5 million people or more in the city limits. Isn't that something? And um, it's uh, just uh, people everywhere, very modern in Beijing. But then I was in the middle of nowhere, uh, where it was like a third world country as, as well. The people in the city... Uh, the economy is booming. We know this. We hear this in the news. The economy is booming, and, and uh, people have thought, well, all China needs is just economic prosperity. They have plenty of that. They're building skyscrapers like, like crazy. Uh, but what China really needs is the gospel. And, uh, and in your notes, I have the third and fourth lessons. Uh, just kind of go over those real quickly. China's great need is the gospel. I believe that with all my heart. Secondly, the church in China's great need is the systematic teaching of Scripture, like I mentioned a moment ago. Um, that's what Brother Soon told me. He said, we don't need your money, but we need some teachers. We need people coming here and, and just going through the Scriptures with us, giving us a basis of, and a theological basis. That's what we... Uh, that's what we need. I want to show you some pictures of the teaching ministry that we had. So uh, let's go ahead and let's show uh, the next set of pictures. I have several. In that compound, that first place, that was the little teaching center that, that we had. Wasn't too big, but it just, just crammed full. This is the industrial thing. That was kind of the, the hiding uh, part of, of where we were. And I just wanted to get a picture of that. Um, the, the Chinese people, let's stop with this picture for a second. The Chinese people love object lessons, and they love to act out stories. It's almost, it was almost like a junior church in some ways. Um, they loved hand signals and motions and that type of thing. And uh, so I was, I was teaching a lesson. Actually, this time I was preaching to them, trying to inspire them on, on a couple of things. And so we went outside, and we acted out a Bible story. And then I had my teaching points and, and this type of thing. And here's the thing. I don't understand it. But they kept telling me, shh, you're too loud, you're too loud, okay? And uh, they wanted me to, to hold it down because if the neighbors had heard that, it would have raised red flags in the area and the police could come and just disrupt everything. Every one of these students, um, and I'm teaching part of them right here, uh, every one of these students had come in for this meeting. It was a, like a four or five day conference, as it were, and our teaching team just, just worked with them. And you see on the far left, this young lady, her name is Grace, uh, 
and a beautiful story from Grace, uh, grew up in a part of China on the far western edge of China. And it, um, all her neighbors were secret Muslims. And, and she, was, she, w- she came to Christ out of living in an atheistic country with neighbors that were Muslims. And she's given her heart to the Lord. And a uh, very brilliant young lady, she wants to go back to western China and convert Muslims to Christianity. Isn't that something? And just uh, really blessed by, by that. Notice, if you will, let's, let's look at a few other pictures here. I just wanted to give you some teaching uh, shots. And... Um, uh, we're just, we're, we, like I said, we were acting out a story. Let's move on. We got, I think, two or three more. Uh, the, uh, the class, a lot of young Christians, young people that are serving the Lord. Uh, and that didn't happen until the last few years. Uh, just a kind of an explosion of young people that are in their 20s that are now church leaders. And there they're doing some hand motions. They were learning a, uh, some kind of thing from, from one of the other teachers as um, uh, as well. I want you to look with me in the, in the passage that I have uh, that will be up on the screen here from 2 Timothy 3.15. And Paul is talking to Timothy and he says this, you have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. You know, one of the reasons why I was so blessed to see these young people baptized today, these, these kids, that I mean, one after another, because you knew there were some parents and some Sunday school teachers and some Awana workers and some camp workers and others that abandoned their own agenda, at least for a time, and, and even gave up some, some time and some energy, maybe even some money, and taught them what the Scripture has to say. And as this verse just indicates, it's the teaching of the Scripture that brings us to the point of understanding that we need to be saved. And, um, and so that's what China needs as well. Okay, um, let's see. I think picture number six is what I want to show. Uh, and, uh, and then let's go to seven and, uh, and eight, okay? Uh, let's go back to six. I'm sorry. I want to show you this first, then we'll get to that. Um, the first place that was in that compound that was the size of this, uh, this room, and um, we left there and went to another place. And, uh, and we waited to leave at night we drive these back roads. Um, in fact, the road was even out. We went across a couple bridges. They were out. We had to drive the vehicle through riverbanks, and it was quite something. Took us maybe, we went through a little mountain area, and literally, we're in the middle of nowhere, China. I mean, in the boondocks. And um, we get into this agricultural area, and we're, and we're driving along with cornfields on either side of the road. I felt right at home, okay? And we have cornfields on either side, and then we start slowing down, and all of a sudden, out of the cornfield, this guy comes out, and he just points, and he, and he steps back in the corn, and, uh, and the van turned, okay? And, and now we're going down a path, and we go down this path, for a couple hundred yards, and this lady steps out of the corn, points, and we turn. And, um, and, and, you know, it took me a little while to figure this out. These are the lookouts. Because if, they're, if this is a trap, if the police are there, uh, if this is unsafe, we're turning around and going back somewhere. And uh, so, you know, the, the lookouts were getting, it's a little cloak and dagger. I kind of love this, Bruce. This is, you know, cloak and dagger stuff. And um, so we sneak in, um, we, go, we come to the edge of this village, they turn off the van lights, everything's dark, and they sneak us in, they won't even let us take our suitcases, somebody else brings our suitcases in. Now we're in a compound, another compound, that's about as big as this section right here. And um, in this compound live 22 people, um, at, uh, 24-7, and this just, and that is a couple of stories uh, but these, these young people, they're in their 20s, early 20s, they've come to this place, and it's like we would call it a Bible college. Um, they call it an academy, and, we're, and, we're, we, and we stay there. This picture is in the basement of the compound where we had our classes. And they told me over and again, do not take a picture. Well, I got a picture, okay? Um, and, um, 
I just quickly, you know, we quickly snatched a couple of pictures. But this is in a basement of a secret location in nowhere China, and God came down and ministered in, in a great way. I mean, literally felt the presence of the Lord, and we taught them again, eight hours every day. They were up at the crack of dawn and, and praying and singing, and then way past when I went to bed, they were still at it as, as well. God just blessed us in a, in a marvelous way. Okay, that's... Um, Let's show the next picture, okay? Uh, okay, that looks nasty, and it is nasty. Uh, those are duck intestines, yeah. And I know what you're thinking, and I know what you're wanting to ask, and the answer is no, I did not. Did not eat that, but my fellow teachers did. Um, no, I had enough of that kind of stuff by that day, okay? Uh, and uh, now go to the next picture. These, we, as we're driving, to that second place, and, and uh, it's at night, we saw all these Chinese people out in the, I would call it the forest, and they had these flashlights and stuff, and they, um, and I, well, what's going on out there? And the interpreter said, well, they're catching these bugs. The, the, the mother bug would come and lay these eggs, and, uh, and then they, the bugs stay in the ground for like three years, and then they come crawling out, and they're only alive for four or five days, but they come out by the, you know, gajillion, and uh, the Chinese people catch them, and then they roast them, and then they eat them. There you go. And the answer is yes. I did eat these things, okay? And they weren't too bad, um, but I'm not going to ever do it again as long as I live, okay? <laughs> they roasted, and, 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 but they really weren't that bad, um, uh, to be honest. You know what? I want you to just jot this down in your notes if you're, if you're taking notes. And this is kind of a silly thing on the food, but sometimes missionary work is hard. You know, I'm a taco and burrito guy. I'm not a bug and intestines kind of guy. Um, and, and it was all I could do. At times, missionary work is hard. Um, I, I looked on the internet where I was going, where I was teaching, and I figured the first place that I, you know, I, I looked at the uh, information on the internet, the first place I went to would have had the um, climate of Dallas, Texas. A little bit of air conditioning when it worked. Um, in my room, it was air conditioned. In the teaching room, not so much, okay? Um, and this was late July, early August. The second place we went to had the climate of Houston, Texas. No air conditioning to speak of at all. It was hot. In that, in that basement room, they had some fans. And literally, when I wasn't teaching, I wasn't sitting down. I was standing in front of that fan, just letting it go. But at times, the electricity would go off. And this must be a regular thing, because all the kids, all the students, immediately just had a little light, flashlight that they had hit on. And, uh, but the fans would go off, and it would become stifling. Um, can I just, rem you know, missionary work can sometimes be hard. Uh, just hard work. And um, so, uh, God bless. Uh, notice with me this passage, 2 Timothy 2. Um, Paul said, And because I preach the good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. What's Paul saying? I'll endure a bug I'll endure some intestines. I'll endure no air conditioning. I'll endure a hard bed. I'll endure a 147-hour flight over to Beijing. It wasn't quite that, but it seemed that long, all right? Um, I'll endure those things because people need to be saved. People need to be told about Jesus. People need to come to Christ or they'll split hell wide open. I want them to be saved. Sometimes missionary work is hard. Um, after we taught for, for uh, the better part of two weeks or so, I had a couple of days in Beijing. And uh, when I was in Beijing, went to uh, the Great Wall of China. And uh, they, uh, had, the organization had a driver take me up there. And uh, I, uh, I got on the Great Wall, and it was about a two to three hour ordeal. Um, the Great Wall goes, where, where I went and entered the wall, you could go right or left, and both places, uh, it was real, kind of straight uphill. You're at elevation already, and the, uh, the steps are not standard like these steps are. One step would be like this, and the next step would be like that, and then the next step, and then the next step. And it was just, it was a, it was a good, hard hike. Did you see the news this week, that Justin Bieber dude? Did you see that? He had to have people carry him. 
I'm an old fat guy, and I did it on my own, you know. I just wanted to, you know, anyway. Um, it took me a couple hours. While I'm, while I'm making that journey, a couple strange things started happening. Uh, this is, it was the school break for the Chinese, and a lot of families on the Great Wall that day, Chinese families. I'll tell you this, when I was, in both times that I was teaching in, in those different places, I had people come up to me and, and want to get a picture and then tell me through the interpreter, you're the first uh, non-Chinese person I've ever seen in my life. I've, only, I've never seen anybody with, with, with skin like you. And, and then they don't grow hair on their arms or anything. And a couple of my buddies with me are just like, you know, human sweaters. You know, they just, you know, hair everywhere. And they just couldn't get over that. And so I had to, I had to point that out all the time. Um, and, um, and they had never seen blue eyes. And so now I'm on the Great Wall. And, and I wasn't thinking of that. But all of a sudden, these little kids that were five, six years old would come running up in front of me and just stare at me and then run off. <laughs> and then I'd see their, their mom would, 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 you know, I'd be go a little bit longer and some mom would be bent over and just point at me, go, 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 away, go on, go on. And, and the little kid would come running over and, and then just freak out, ah, and then run off. <laughs> and, and I just really didn't figure it out, okay? While I'm on the wall, let's go to this next picture. I ran into this dude. The only guy I saw dressed like that. And that's how, you know, you expect Chinese people with a hat and, and, and pajama-looking things. And uh, so I stopped and got his picture. And as soon, or I stopped him and got his picture. And as soon as I got his picture, about 30 people rushed us and wanted his picture and my picture. I thought, what is, you know, and it just doesn't, it didn't dawn on me. Go to the next one. Uh, after he left, these kids started hitting me. And I apologize to your Kansas State-loving pastor but I'm a Jayhawk dude, okay? <laughs> so, sorry, Bruce. And, uh, and, and, you know, that blue shirt makes the eyes pop out a little bit more. This is how I used, you know, this is what I used to get Pam to marry me. <laughs> Look into my eyes. <laughs> and, uh, and so people started running up and wanted my picture. After, after about 10 or 15 minutes of this, I got... I thought, well, hey, I'm going to get some pictures too. So I got a few pictures with some of these kids. And it was just, it was kind of fun for me to, to do that. Um, but I got attention because there was something different about me. At first I thought, man, what's the deal? Have you ever never seen a big fat white guy before <laughs> going up these steps at elevation? Um, and, then, and then somebody who spoke English told me, said, oh, you're the one people are talking about, the man with blue eyes. And it dawned on me, okay, now eye color is nothing but a surface thing. But isn't it true that the world should see something else inside of us because we're different, because we have Jesus Christ? Isn't that true? And, and I want you to just jot this in your notes. Number six, we are all missionaries. And because we're all missionaries, others need to see something different within us. Not eye color, not skin color, not anything like that. They need to see something different inside us because we have the Holy Spirit. And we're all missionaries um, in this world. Notice the passage. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and, gives, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Um, okay, one more picture I want to I show you. Uh, the, uh, this is Jed and Lucy. Uh, Jed and Lucy were probably my favorite students because uh, uh, Lucy actually spoke a little English and Jed was along for the ride. And um, the, uh, just a delightful couple, a lot of energy, a passion to, passion to, to lead people to Christ. And um, we were having a little question and answer and someone gave me the question, could you explain Luke 16.9? And so uh, I looked it up on my iPad, and I, and I read the verse, and then I uh, began to explain it to him. The verse says this, I, and it's Luke 16, 9. I tell you, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. In this way, your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven. Isn't that something? Um, 
That's what the scripture tells us. Use your resources to make friends. Use your resources to win people to Christ. Use your resources, then you'll lay up for yourself a treasure in heaven. What a neat thing that, that uh, uh, concept that was. Um, as I explained this to him, the interpreter took a time out and told me, she said, Tim, she said, in, uh, in China, we've never been taught anything about tithing or giving. And, uh, and in essence, what she's saying, you need to explain this further. And um, so I reached into my pocket and I pulled out 20 yuan, which was about $4, give or take, three, $4. And I said, okay, I'm, I want to give this to somebody that will use it for ministry purposes because I can't do ministry here in China. I, I just want to give this to someone and then I want you to let me know what you plan to do with it. And nobody would take the money. I had to kind of beg them finally. And Jed stood up and he took the money. Uh, Jed and I and Lucy, we've been trading some emails back and forth. And Jed said that he took the money and he went and bought a music stand. Uh, maybe like that one over there. And he said, we're going to the park and I'm going to preach in the park. I said, okay, you know, an email. In communist China, you're going to preach in the park. He said, yeah. He says, I'm just going to do it till the police come. And then we'll start singing. And um, he said, but I'm going to preach in the park. He said, I'll use my money to get the gospel, that money you gave me to get the gospel out. Okay, I don't know if anybody's gotten saved yet. Because frankly, I haven't heard from Jed for, maybe the police caught him. I haven't heard from him for a few weeks. Um, but when we get to heaven someday, wouldn't it be awesome if some Chinese dude walks up to me and says, hey, I want you to know, I got saved in a park. And, and the reason I got saved is some guy was down there preaching, and he was preaching because you gave him some money, and he bought a stand, and he got this idea to preach. Won't that be like, you know, make my day in heaven? Just because of, of three, four, five bucks of Chinese money I passed along to him? Um, see, church, here's the thing. When, when we get involved in this kind of work around the world, the eternal rewards just keep on coming. Now, this is a church that has a great message to tell. I wished every church had the, the, would tell the same message you tell. I wished every church would care about children and teenagers. From what I gathered, preacher, I, I'm guessing 20-some people have been saved in the last couple of weeks, children and teens and, and, and adults as well. Isn't that an amazing thing? You have a message to tell. Amen. <clears throat> What a, what a blessed thing. Uh, and we have the same message to tell around the world. And when we involve ourselves in missions work, then we're involving ourselves in God's work around the world. Over the next three weeks or so, you're going to have some missionaries come. And uh, you're going to have somebody from Russia. You're going to have somebody from Wales and someone from Africa, if I got it straight. And they're going to tell their stories and maybe show their pictures and share their heart and you can be a partner with them, if you will, and be involved in, in God's work around the world. What an exciting thing that is. Um, we, are, we are blessed in our church, and we have a few missionaries out of our church. And uh, when they write back and send us, and we've done some Skype things on Sunday morning and stuff, and when we, re we hear about those that are saved, man, we just get so cranked up and pumped up, knowing that, hey, we have a part in this ministry. Um, and I hope you feel the same way. I know you support Corey and Jesse Lyons in this church. And, uh, boy, just a young couple. And, and um, it's, uh, they've gone over to, to the Philippines, and they started this children's ministry. And they, uh, they fix up these trucks, and they, they do a puppet show out at the back end of the truck. And they do some singing. They have some speakers up there. They do some motions, and, and, and you know, they have a character dressed up, a Bible character, tell a story. And... Uh, and this truck goes from place to place, and they've got like 20 trucks going place to place. And every week, they reach about 5,000 kids. And Glenville has a part in that ministry. And you have a part in that ministry when you give unto the Lord. And you know what? Um, when, uh, when these kids get saved uh, at camp or in Awana, you have a part in that when you give in the offering here. And when, and when the teenagers get, get saved and they're baptized at the lake, you're having a part in that 
when you're giving in this offering, sustaining this ministry. Uh, when we talk about abandonment, sometimes the Lord calls people to abandon their life. Sometimes the Lord calls people to abandon just a little money out of their pocket to help the ministry go forth. And I hope and trust that over the next, uh, next month in this church here at Glenville, you'll seriously consider what God would have you to do to help in this, in, in this great ministry around the world. And, uh, and I hope that God gets a hold of your heart and perhaps some of you say, you know what, we're just going to carve out some money and we're going to give it each week to missions work. We're going to support the church better. We're going to help. This is what God would have us to do. Pray about that. See what the Lord would have you to do. And as these missionaries come in, get to know them and pray for them fervently and really become a ministry partner with them. They need that. They want that. And that's what we can do for them. Would you bow your heads with me this morning, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed? Maybe you're here this morning, and God is stirring your heart for worldwide ministry. You know, we can't all go, um, like, uh, like I went just for a short time, and, 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 and most people can't do that. Um, but we can all be involved. We can all give. We can all have a part in, in God's work around the world. And I hope and trust and pray that you'll be open to what the Lord would have you to do. Now, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for loving us and, and giving us eternal life. And we're so grateful and thankful, Lord, that, uh, that we know you as our personal Savior. And uh, now we are faced with a challenge, individually and as a church body as well, of being involved in a, in a ministry opportunity around the world uh, because the souls of men and women and boys and girls hang in the balance. Lord, I'm so, I'm so thrilled this morning to see um, these, these children be baptized. Uh, boy, it takes me back, Lord, to when I was a child in this church. And I'm so grateful this church is faithful uh, to your word and to your scripture and that um, from the pastor and the deacons and throughout the rest of the congregation, there is a heart and there is a passion here to reach children and, and reach teenagers and reach adults with the gospel. But Lord, today we think about the kids over in China, and I think about the kids in Russia, and I think about the kids in Wales, I think about the kids in Africa. And how will they know unless somebody goes and tells them about your, about your love and about your, your message, about Jesus Christ? And how can anybody go unless a church like this, filled with willing individuals like this, will say, let us help. Let us get the gospel over there. And we'll support, we'll pray, we'll, we'll uh, emotionally um, encourage these missionaries. And so, Lord, I pray you'd light a fire in this church over the next several weeks and help them to come to a place of real abandonment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.